Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak in front of a packed house. Um, I want to thank, thank Hui and the, the whole team for uh, not only having us here, but for going through the immense effort of putting this exhibit together in a way that made the whole thing seem effortless. Um, I, I'm going to tell you about work that we've been doing that um, has lots to do with how the human brain compares to other brains and in many ways how the human brain is com complex to the point that some people would consider that it's the most complex structure in the universe. I don't know about that part, but um, we'll, 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 I'll walk you through it. So I like to start always with simple definitions of what we're talking about. I, I know that complexity is a word, word that we use very easily when we want to talk about anything that's complicated, but complex and complicated are not, not exactly the same thing. Um, let me give you a, uh, three examples of um, things that are in many ways similar, but that you would probably also say that they are different in their complexity. You have, uh, I'll, I'll show you three structures built of Legos, so built of those tiny little plastic building blocks. Here we have one, there you have a second structure, it's also a house, and here you have a third one, it's also a house. How would you describe these three structures? You could, you could use the same word for the three of them, all, all three are buildings, they're houses, you could say that one is bigger than the other, which is bigger than the, the first one, yes. But you would also be correct in saying that the yellow one is much more complex than the other ones. And um, I'm, I'm not going to do to you what I love to do to my own students, which is to just extract a definition out of them. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a definition already. I'll give you my favorite one. Um, it's the physics definition of complexity, which is the amount of information that defines a system. Complexity is a measure of how much information goes into defining a system. And I, I love that definition also because it works both ways. Both as here's a system, how many words do you need to describe it? and you would need many more words to describe that building, the yellow building at the bottom, than to describe the other ones. But it also works in the other direction. Here's a bunch of Legos. Here are the instructions to put together this building. And we're gonna talk about both of them. And it's very helpful that it doesn't matter which of the two definitions, which of the two ways we're thinking of, they, they amount to the same in the end you also realize that there is a relationship between complexity and size. When you have a bigger pile of Legos, it's much easier to build something complex than when you have just a few little building blocks, right? Even though I could perfectly well build a, a, a giant-sized version of this little house here, it would be enormous, but it would still be very simple, right? Because it would take very little information to, to define it. But even though size is not a guarantee of complexity, the opposite is generally true. Something that is enormously complex tends to be made of many, many, many parts. And I'll come back to that. But that's an idea that um, I want to introduce to you because when you want to understand the human brain and how it came to be, how come we say that the human brain is so complex? One image that comes to mind very rapidly is this image of brain evolution. What you're seeing here is uh, zero to the right is today. And you're looking at the size, the estimated size of the brain that we have today and how it increased very rapidly over the last two million years or so, ever since our last ancestors. And let me just continue just to give you an idea. This, if you went back to 50 million years ago when primates first appeared, you would keep going to the left with this line here and the, the line would go a long ways and you would still be, have a, a very small increase from let's say 5 million uh, to 
50 and then 500 grams in the size of the brain over 50 million years, which is what makes it so remarkable that over just 2 million years, you have a brain that triples in size and becomes what our brain is today. So if you, if you compare our evolutionary history to the evolutionary history of all other animals that exist today, you will not find anything as dramatic, anything, any change as steep as this one, which is one of the many reasons why for a very long time we clung to the idea that the human brain is extraordinary. It's made unlike any other brain. There's nothing in the, in the universe quite like our brain. Until people started investigating different species with now uh, a slightly more optimistic expectation in mind, maybe they're actually capable of doing much more interesting things than we think they can. And then somebody uh, gives, somebody in that case was a, a, a scientist in Japan, somebody thinks of giving a chimpanzee access to video games. You know what happens? We're not the only ones who love video games. Chimpanzees will work to have access to video games. And check this one out. This is Ayumu playing a game that you might have played before. If you haven't, you absolutely should visit the exhibit and um, try for yourself. But this is what Ayumu does. You see numbers from one to nine flash appear on the screen. Ayumu will touch the screen when he's ready to go, and then what he's gonna do next, well, you see. My question to you is, could you do this? <laughs> uh, all right, my exact question to you should be, could you do this as rapidly and accurately as Ayumu does? Um, you, you notice that Ayumu is not just touching the screen randomly. He gets the sequence right, which means not necessarily that he understood numbers, but definitely that he understood that the little squiggles come with some hierarchy that has to be um, obeyed in, in how he touches them. So, of course, when this study came out, people jumped to, to the quick conclusion of saying, oh, and they, they tested graduate uh, college students against Ayumu, and Ayumu beat every single one of the, the college students. So the conclusion of the first paper was, chimpanzees can do even better than humans at working memory and identifying symbols. And then, thankfully, some other researchers um, were maybe probably slightly insulted by that idea, and they decided, no, 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 no. This was not a fair comparison. You have to give humans a fair chance to, be, to beat the chimpanzee, right? So you got to let the humans practice as much as Ayumu did, did. And to our relief, humans do exactly as well as Ayumu when they have just as much opportunity to practice, which is very important. We'll come back to that. But that brings me to, the, um, to a problem that we had when I started comparing the human brain to other brains and trying to understand how come we say that we do all these things and other animals don't. Um, this was about 15 years ago, and then the idea was that all brains, at least all mammalian brains, were made in very much the same way. What that meant was that if you were to take two brains of the same size, you would expect them to be made of similar numbers of neurons. And because neurons are the Legos that build brains, they're the basic unit, functional units that put brains together, if these two brains are made of similar numbers of neurons, and by the way, they're very respectable 400 gram brains about this big. If they're made of similar numbers of neurons, you would expect that these two brains, the owners of these two brains, should have similar cognitive capabilities, and yet you would discover that one belongs to a chimpanzee, and we've just seen what chimpanzees can do, and the other belongs to a cow. And this is the moment where we could uh, take a, a detour and start debating what we really know about how intelligent cows are, and uh, you know how do we really know that they're not deep in, in philosophy, in mental philosophy, when they're out there in the pastures. Maybe that's how smart they are, that they just do all that and don't let us um, realize it. But 
And that, by the way, is one of the most difficult things to do in this area of science. It's measuring behavior, it's putting a number to behavior, particularly in a way that you can then compare to other things that have numbers like how many neurons you have in, in a brain. We don't even have a definite answer um, to how do cows compare to chimpanzees in terms of cognition, to be fair. For now, we're just gonna go with the instinct. Let's say that chimpanzees are capable of much more complex and flexible um, cognition and behavior than cows are. So the question becomes, how come if they have brains of about the same size, especially if they have cerebral cortices of about the same size. Now, um, let me just point this out to you because this is the, the star of our show, I believe, today. This is the cerebral cortex of a monkey. So it's the part of, of brain that pretty much sits on top of the rest of the brain. And that is an interesting way of describing it because the way the cortex is connected to the rest of the brain pretty much is as a structure that you don't technically need, you still have behavior without a cortex, because all the circuits that really operate the body, all the circuits that really produce behavior, they are subcortical. They, they uh, occur in other structures that don't involve the cortex. But the cerebral cortex does the very important job of receiving copies of absolutely every single thing that happens in the rest of the brain. And it has the possibility of combining all that information, of putting it all together, of creating associations that weren't there before, and then acting back on the rest of the brain and modifying your behavior again. So that is why the, com the, the cortex is the structure that we think about when we think of how the brain creates complexity moving, um, de detecting stimuli that touch your, your body. There are plenty of other parts of the brain that do that, but really putting information together, giving you a past and a future, that's your cerebral cortex at work. So we wanted to find out how many neurons the cerebral cortex were, was built with. And that's where I realized that we didn't have a technique that really allowed that to be done um, rapidly enough efficiently enough and accurately enough. So I came up with my own technique, which is um, something that each and every one of you could do here in your kitchen, which is um, appropriately called brain soup. So I've been making brain soup for 15 years now, and it's, it's not a kind of soup that you would want to drink be because it is made in detergent. But it starts like any soup with uh, peeling and chopping and um, mushing things in a detergent solution. And that gives you these vials, these little jars with a certain volume of dissociated cells that have their nuclei, the cell nuclei. Remember back from school, every cell has one nucleus and only one nucleus. As long as that's true, it's, that's very handy here because instead of counting cells, we can count cell nuclei that are free floating in suspension in this soup. And because I know exactly what the volume of that soup is, I can just take some drops of that soup under a microscope and I can, in just a matter of 10 to 15 minutes, I can count how many cells, how many nuclei, and therefore how many cells I had in per volume of that suspension. And because I know the full volume of the suspension, just I just multiply all the numbers and I get, in 15 minutes, I get the total estimate of how many cells that structure had. So, I'll, I'll give you now some numbers that we have for the, for the cortex, and what you see is that, well, we have on average 86 billion neurons in the human brain, not 85 billion. 16 billion of those neurons are in the cerebral cortex. And so those are the, num the, the neurons that we care about. You see that it's a small percentage of all the neurons in the brain, even though the cortex is the, the largest portion of the, of the brain. Now, the numbers, what we really care about having that number is being able to compare it to other species. And here's what we find. So this is us with 16 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex. And you see how the, sec the, the, the species with the second largest number of neurons in the cerebral cortex are orangutans and um, gorillas. 
Next, you have chimpanzees and also elephants. We, can, as we estimate that cetaceans are around here with cortices that are even bigger than a human cortex, but fewer neurons, but with fewer neurons in the cortex than a human. So just to give you an idea, an elephant brain is three, three times the size of a human brain. It's about the size of my forearm. Its cortex alone is twice the size of our human cortex but it only has about one-third as many neurons as we do. Now, that's not because elephants are any special, much less humans are any special. If you look at where we sit on this curve, we accompany the other triangles here, which are other primate species. Primates have a brain that is made differently from brains of other species. The only animals that you find in nature that have very large numbers of neurons in their cerebral cortex are either very large or they are primates. Um, so you put this all together, you realize that uh, Darwin was a primate. Darwin had a brain made in the image of other primates. It's something that uh, it, his book, The Descent of Man, where he proposed exactly that, that the human, including human brain, uh, was made in the image of other primates. It was published nearly 150 years ago. I love to think that he would have appreciated having this information very much. And what's so special about primates is that the way the primate brain is made, it, it's with neurons that don't become much larger as they become more numerous. Contrary to all other mammals, if you're not a primate, as evolution creates, as, as, more, as larger brains appear with more neurons in the cortex, those neurons also become larger. That means that the cortex grows exponent, it, it grows in, uh, in an inflationary manner. You gain neurons, you gain, you gain 10 times as many neurons, but your cortex becomes 45 times bigger. Not if you're a primate. If you're a primate and you have 10 times more neurons, you have a cortex that's only 10 times bigger as well, which, leads to some interesting uh, com uh, comparisons, like you have a giraffe with a fairly large brain that has 1.7 billion neurons in the cortex, and that's about as many neurons as you find in the cortex of a macaque monkey that could very easily ride on the back of that giraffe and has a much smaller cortex. Like I told you, we have three times as many neurons as uh, an elephant's cerebral cortex, even though our cortex is much, is much smaller. Speaking of elephants, then we could, we could ask why don't we have, why don't other species have many more neurons, especially other species, other primate species like gorillas. So just to give you an idea of why we would expect gorillas to have more neurons than, than human brains. Um, in nature, there is an overall trend for larger animals to have larger brains. And gorillas are about two to three times bigger than humans, so you would expect a gorilla brain to be bigger than uh, a human brain, and it's instead, it's the other way around. Our brain is three times the size of, uh, of a gorilla brain, and it has 16 billion, not 8 billion. Why is that? It turns out that neurons are very expensive and they require lots of energy and lots of energy require lots of time spent eating. When you do the math, you realize that an elephant can only be elephant sized if it eats 18 hours per day. Imagine your life if you had to eat 18 hours per day. You would not be here, you would be dead long, long ago because you need to sleep about eight hours per day. Remember that part? Um, so you might think that, oh, okay, when you do the math, uh, human, if we ate like other primates, we would need to eat about nine and a half hours per day. Definitely sounds much more reasonable than eating 18 hours per day to be elephant-sized. Would still not work. Imagine your life if all the time that you dedicate to going to work and working were actually spent looking for food and eating every single moment of your waking life. Um, and yet we obviously are here and um, I won't keep you guessing or waiting for the answer. The answer is something very, very simple, so simple that we now take it for granted, and that is cooking. F cooking in the sense of modifying the food that we eat, transforming the food that we eat before we put it in our, in our mouths, first with stone tools, later with fire, but 
Cooking is what allows you in a variety of ways to eat more in less time, to get more calories from the, the, the same amount of food. And it brings the very important consequence of having free time. So in this sense, we can think of cooking as really any type of technology in according to the simple definition also that technology is any object process method or even knowledge whose application helps solve a problem faster, therefore giving you time, freeing up time that also allows you to have to tackle new problems. And when you think of that, it was uh, the, the advent of cooking first with stone tools, then with fire, offers a very, very simple and powerful explanation to how come the human brain and the human brain alone became so large so fast in our evolution. But that's not all. Um, the things go even faster once you start, uh, once you have, once you start being able to afford all those neurons in your brain, you end up, humanity as a whole went very rapidly. So if, it, if, it took us, if it took us about one and a half million years to go from a brain that was 500 grams in size to three times as much, it only took us 200,000 years to go from a brain that ate exclusively um, fruits, or uh, sorry, uh, raw foods to, to a brain that had, that, uh, that had culture, that developed agriculture just 10,000 years ago, and then division of, of labor and complex civilizations, then distribution systems for distributing food like supermarkets, and then with electricity, you get refrigerators in your home, which make getting enough calories much, much easier to the point where you can just go to the corner restaurant and get, get all those 2,000 calories that you need in a day in a simple 15 minutes, which leads us to another problem, um, which is how do we stop eating now that we have enough food? And the irony of it all is that the answer often is we go back to raw foods. We go back to raw, uncooked foods exactly because of how few calories they, they give us. Um, now, how do we get from here to complexity? Well, I showed you already how, I gave you an idea of how quickly human life became incredibly more complex to the point of developing electricity, refrigerators, and even being able to get all the calories we want in just 15 minutes. Now, there's something else very important that we just found out that happens as you gain more neurons. You, a warm-blooded species. What you see here is each dot is one species, and you see that the more neurons a species of mammal or bird, the more neurons a, a species has in the cerebral cortex, the longer it takes to reach sexual maturity, meaning the longer its childhood lasts, the later it reaches puberty, and once it reaches puberty, the longer it lives. And at this point, it should be no surprised to realize that we fit just right on that line. Our species takes as, it spends as long in childhood as it should and lives as long as it should after reaching adulthood for the number of neurons that we have. That means that as our species, as our brain increased, gained neurons in evolution, Another thing, very, another very important thing happened to our ancestors, which was that they gained more and more time. More and more time to learn from the environment, more and more time to um, pass that information along, to more and more time to overlap with the generations before them. And that is fundamental, and we're going back to Legos now, because that is what, uh, it's having the time to, um, interact with the world to actually use your brain that leaves us from what our biological capacities, capabilities, to what our developed abilities, meaning those things, what you do with the brain that you have. And those are the things that depend on technologies, on developing new ways of doing things and having the means to, uh, to pass that information onwards. Um, if you haven't seen this TED Talk, this is my favorite TED Talk ever. It's only nine minutes. I strongly 
urge you to, to watch it. It's Hans Rosling. He unfortunately passed away one or two years ago. He was this wonderful physician and institution in uh, Sweden, and he talks about why he believes that the washing machine was the most transformative piece of technology in modern times. And it's simply because of what I told you of how the washing machine freed up time for women in particular to be able to, to spend, to invest that time in themselves. Why is this so important? Because if you have a small amount of Legos or a huge pile of Legos, you not only need more energy to, fe to feed that larger number of neurons, uh, neurons or, or, or Legos, but you, it, you also need much more time and much more information to direct the formation of, the, of, that, um, of that system. And that happens through self-organization. It turns out that there are not enough genes in the, expressed in the human brain. There, there's not enough information in our biology alone to direct the formation of, an, of the extremely uh, complex brain how it is. What happens though is I like to think of our brain as this block of raw material that contains all possible sculptures in the, wor in the world. They're all contained in that block. But even then, that block is nothing yet while as, as a block unless it gets shaped. And the, the block that is the, the brain gets shaped as it assimilates information from the outside, as it, as it gets used, and that information starts shaping that block of tissue, removing the bits that don't belong and strengthening the bits that do make sense. And that's how you end up having a brain that is not just biological capabilities, but is also full of developed abilities. And from there, things grow very, very fast as you use those capabilities to develop technologies. Um, those abilities feed back into even more technologies. And then, of course, you, as you enjoy having this feedback, this positive feedback loop, you start interacting with other brains, and as you teach other brains, you start shaping them as well and encouraging those other brains to have their capabilities shaped into abilities, which is what uh, yet another level of complexity in our lives. That's how um, we go from being individuals to being um, part of a much more complex uh, unity, which is human society, humanity as a whole, which is why I like to think that humanity has long, long, long transcended the individual human brain, the, indi the individual human brain, which is also why we so badly need places like this and like universities and like exhibits and any form of human interaction that fosters this type of transfer of information that helps shape our brains and takes us here. So I'll wrap up. If you ask me what is the human advantage, what do we do that nobody else does to this extent is we cook. We have the largest number of neurons in the cerebral cortex thanks to that uh, technology that our ancestors developed. And we have so many neurons, we've become so capable and able through technology and culture that we now would not be humans anymore if we only had those 16 billion neurons in the cortex, but gave up on the passing of knowledge and technology through teaching. So I'll leave you with my invitation to do your part and pass on words what you've learned. Thank you so much.
Okay, it's working. Botart, um, very happy to be here. Thanks so much, Rui, for uh, organizing this event. And it's an honor to be, uh, to be a part of the Brain Wider, the Wider Than the Sky exhibit. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming out and hopefully you will learn at least one thing from this talk. Um, and uh, what I wanted to start out with is the idea of, is this uh, going here? Here we go. Um, how does the average person think about their brain? Most of us have seen in the newspaper, in a magazine, something like this, this type of illustration, that it looks kind of like a walnut, that there's lightning bolts coming out of it sometimes, that it's blue. You know, this is like the illustration meme of the day. You, uh, you know, one artist kind of conceived of it this way and then everybody copies one another and pretty soon every brain is blue and has lightning bolts coming out of it. Uh, <laughs> And if you think about what a neuron looks like, this is probably what you would think of in that regard as well. Uh, you have a cell body, you have dendrites, these branches coming off of that cell body, and you have little bolts of electricity, uh, changes in, in uh, membrane potential, which are carrying signals from one neuron to the other. So this is another example of, and to be fair, you know, we're trying to show with this type of image that the brain is made of these units but it doesn't look anything like this in real life. I mean, you don't have this much space between neurons, for example. It's all just crammed in there as much as you can possibly cram it in. Um, this is another example of an image that you may have seen, uh, which is called a functional magnetic resonance image. Uh, this is when they stick your head in a big magnet and they're reading the difference in, uh, in oxygen saturation of iron molecules. And this is telling us, for example, maybe this person is picking their nose in this, or maybe this is what your brain looks like when your butt is itchy. And the, generally, what this type of image is telling you is that the brain is compartmentalized. You know, we use different parts of our brain for different things. And we do a lot of different things with our brain. And as long as we're dispelling this here, Susanna, um, one of the ones that I would like to is this myth that we only use 10% of our brains, which is complete nonsense. And perhaps that was given rise to uh, by images like this, that look, it looks like we're only using a small part of it. Um, we would have evolved away our brains a long, long time ago for exactly the reason that Susanna mentioned is that they're very energy expensive and uh, you can't just have an, a bunch of those neurons sitting around doing nothing. Um, many of you may be interest, uh, uh, familiar with this type of image, <coughs> which is a fluorescent micrograph. You're taking the brain, you're slicing it into very, 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 very thin sections and then you're infusing different colors of molecules. These are fluorescent molecules that bind to, uh, to specific types of proteins that give you a much better idea of what the two-dimensional layout of the brain is. So you can get more of a sense of its complexity and structure here. Um, and then, of course, we all know what the meat of the brain looks like. Uh, you know, if I were to chop my head off right now and spill my brain out onto the ground, it would like, look pretty much like this, but probably larger and more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so as a scientist and an artist, um, pardon me one second here, there's a little bit of, a little bit unsure as to what's going on here. Get this video started, here we go. Um, as a neuroscientist and as an, uh, an artist, one of the things that I suffered the most with in grad school, which many of you long-suffering grad students can relate to, is that the second you feel like you understand something truly about the brain is the second that you do a literature search on that topic and you find 5,000 papers that were already published on it and then you recognize that the collective human knowledge about the brain probably encompasses less than a percent of what is actually going on into it. So the overall idea is that our brains are really, really complicated. And that was what I wanted to be able to transmit to people. I mean, our brains are the most fundamental things about us. And we know so little about them. Each of us thinks about our own brain uh, a, a very small amount um, for how important it is, really. And so this was the art piece um, entitled Self-Reflected. Uh, that was to that end. This 
is a physical object hanging on the wall. This is not a digital simulation. Um, this is hanging at a museum in Philadelphia. And this is the collective activity of half a million neurons in a, in a single piece of art. I'll talk a little bit about how this was made, but what you're looking at is an incredibly finely etched surface. It's a gold surface that has lights over the top of it, which are able to give it these different multicolor types of effects and these animations. You know, here we're looking at the cerebellum and you can see the activity of these Purkinje neurons in the folia of the cerebellum reacting to our environment or helping us to move. <clears throat> the full piece is uh, three meters by four meters. And here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking a, just a, a large sheet of paper and I'm moving it and blocking out the lights which are above this, uh, this installation. So there are maybe six different colors of lights here, and you can see how they're picking up different channels of the piece, if you want to think about it that way. <clears throat> um, and this is the brain in animation mode. Uh, this is really the, the nuts and bolts and the guts of the piece. Um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of the brain. So this is as if my brain is cut in this direction, and we're starting at the back here. Right now, we're in the parietal cortex, which is where your vision and your movement are integrated. So this is how our brain helps us to calculate where to reach to pick up an apple uh, or something like this. So again, uh, tying those two things together. This is the somatosensory cortex. Uh, this is the famous homunculus. There's some installations in the exhibit about this, which is where uh, our sense of touch is, essentially. Here's the motor cortex. These are the largest cells in the brain right here, these uh, layer five BET cells. These are sending motor information down into the spinal cord, which will help us to execute our movements. And we're going now, we're, so we're about right here now, um, coming into the frontal cortex. Here's some uh, kind of eye movement areas. And now we're getting into the part of the brain which really differentiates us from, from other primates. It's our frontal cortex. Um, here, the neurons are much more complicated in their morphologies. They're much more branched. There's less of a, a clear delineation between the layers of the cortex in this region. <clears throat> and this is where we're doing things like using logic and planning and a kind of organizing our lives in a very top-down way. And one thing that's really cool about this region, at least in this slice, is that you'll notice that the information is only flowing in this direction. The cortex is kind of imposing its will. This essentially is the will. Imposing itself on the kind of more evolutionarily basic uh, subcortical regions of the brain. This is how we, uh, we exercise impulse control, for example. <clears throat> There's the olfactory bulb down here, which is just above the, uh, the nasal passages. Um, we're coming into midbrain right here, uh, basal forebrain. This right here, bow, this is the nucleus accumbens. This is what helps us kind of attend to stimuli. This is uh, excitement is coming from this region. Uh, here's the basal ganglia right here. This is taking in inputs from a whole lot of different regions, which is integrating our reason and our vision uh, to help us decide how we're going to move. Coming now into the thalamus, this region here, which is crazy complicated. There's so many things coming into this region. This is how the brain is sort of routing information and gating things, which allow us to kind of control where we're paying attention. Um, as we come down a little bit lower here, here's the ventral tegmental area, which is sending up into the, uh, into the nucleus accumbens. And we have some kind of attention-based nuclei here. These are the large uh, ropes of axons that are feeding the spinal cord. And here in the brain stem, so we're like here-ish, these are just basic nuclei for feeding, breathing, this sort of thing. This is like lizard brain kind of region here. <clears throat> and then we go into probably my favorite region of the brain, which is the cerebellum, uh, the big kind of chunk of brain right here, which contains half the neurons in all of the brain, uh, in, in the entire brain. There's about 50 billion of them here. Uh, and these large neurons here, the Purkinje neurons, are helping us to calculate not just our movements, but where is our body in space? Because being able to execute movements is totally dependent on knowing where we are. 
Uh, so that's a vastly complicated system here. Um, now we're going back up. These are the inferior and superior colliculi for hearing and vision. <clears throat> this is the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, which receives information from our eyes, from the retina. It sends it here into, again, the back of the brain. This is the, uh, the primary visual cortex, where these neurons are calculating where all the angles are in space. You know, how are we putting all these, uh, these stimuli together in a way that we can uh, actually attend to them? Uh, that is half a million neurons. There are 86 billion neurons in the brain. That is about a half of a microsecond worth of brain time. And you can do the math as to how much more is actually going on in your head at any given moment. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about how this was done. This is a, uh, a close-up shot of what a micro-etching looks like, basically under a microscope with a macro lens. And you can see that what's red here has an angle of etch. There's little tiny scratches in the surface which are picking up light from a red light which is hanging here, whereas these angles of etch here are going to be picking up light which is coming from a blue light above it here. And it's, if the angle of etch is perpendicular to where the light is, then you will see that as bright, which also means that if you walk around this, that all these colors are going to be changing. It's not fixed into the image. It's merely a reflective surface that's catching whatever light you put on top of it. Um, and this is what the surface looks like under scanning electron microscope. <clears throat> uh, look at this little curly cue right here, if you would. Uh, you'll notice that the angle, as you move across it, changes a little bit. It starts here, it ends about here. And if you were to move the light source across it here, what you would see is a tiny little bolt of light starting here and moving across this surface which is how we get those animated action potentials. This is the basis for um, this reflective microetching technique. Um, so we had to decide what are we going to make this piece on. We decided on a sagittal slice, which is going through your face like this, uh, because it's the only non-symmetrical slice. We can show you the most information uh, in this presentation. And these are the gray matter regions. The gray matter is the places in your brain uh, where the cell bodies actually are. And everything which is a different color here is a different functional region uh, within the gray matter. We had a bunch of uh, lackey undergrads who did the hard work of researching what all the neurons look like in all those regions of the brain, what they're connected to, what their sizes are, what their branching patterns look like, what their fi firing patterns are like. And we amassed this massive amount of data uh, in, uh, in consultation with a bunch of neuroscientists as well who specialize in the different regions. And then we had to paint the neurons themselves. Uh, and rather than extract that from microscopic data or whatever, we wanted to bring a more kind of artistic flair to the piece. And this was the technique that we ended up um, developing for it. What you find very quickly when you try to paint neurons by hand or any kind of branching structure by hand is that your brain is terrible at painting randomness. Your brain has no use for randomness. It picks out patterns in its environment. That's what it's good for. That's what it's evolved for. So when you try to make it do something random, it's always wanting to impose order onto it. So this technique allows you to harness nature's ability and desire to make these beautifully spontaneous branching structures. And as you get better at the technique, we can control the broad strokes of it, but at its heart, there's this randomness uh, to it, which gives you that spontaneity of line. And we painted about 100 to 150 different categories of neurons using this technique, uh, and then we scanned them into the computer and turned them into vector shapes. So we've essentially turned our paintings into math. <clears throat> we made brushes out of them and painted down the entirety of the, of the, uh, the gray matter set. This is about on a couple thousand neurons here, a small region of the cortex. And we put down perhaps a million of them this way. But that only encompasses half of what the brain is actually made of. In this image here, what's darkly stained are the cell bodies, but what's darkly stained here are the myelin sheaths of the axons. Those are the long tubes which are connecting neurons with one another. Uh, 
of which this, the architecture of this region is incredibly beautiful and hard to visualize unless you have the uh, proper techniques. So we turned to some collaborators at Carnegie Mellon University. This is my buddy, John Piles, <coughs> who's going into the scanner here. And uh, we did some diffusion spectrum imaging. Some of you may know uh, diffusion tensor imaging. It's a similar technique to MRI. And you're able to extract, based upon the diffusion of water molecules, where the axons are moving because the axons constrain the movements of the water in very specific ways. So this is a rendering of what those white matter tracks, those axons, look like in our slice of interest only. We've excluded everything else, and we've excluded all the fibers that are moving in this direction because they're useless to us. They would just look like tiny little dots in the piece, so we decided to filter them out. Um, we didn't use that data verbatim. We ended up using it as kind of inspiration to paint this type of data set. Um, these this, is, uh, this would be the thalamus down here, and these are the axons going up into the somatosensory and the parietal cortices, uh, and likewise up into the motor cortex. So we painted many data sets like this as well so that we could then later link everything up together. <clears throat> so this is about where we were right here. Uh, we just have black and white neurons, black and white axons, and many different files encompassing all of that information. But it's the, it's the next step which really brought this project to the next level of complexity for us, which is that think about how the brain communicates just at a very basic level. You have one population of neurons which is communicating with a downstream population of neurons. This, these neurons fire an action potential. They connect up with these neurons. That's one step of information that's been transmitted. <clears throat> so that's kind of the basic unit of what we were calling our neural choreographies uh, in this piece. And lest you think I'm the type of artist who walks into my studio and throws his cape onto the couch and says, what inspiration will strike me today? And uh, just paint whatever comes to mind. This was hardcore engineering. This was, we know what we want it to look like. The brain has, I mean, millions of constraints. How can we engineer our work to get it to look how we want? And so each one of these lines is a neural population going through an axon set to another neural population controlled by about 30 to 40 different variables. Uh, and there's about 600 lines of this code which make up the entirety of the animation for the piece. <clears throat> um, now I'll introduce you into how we think about this. Because we're making an animation, and animation really is just time. Uh, we're, we're thinking about time here. And I apologize to those of you in the audience who are colorblind, but we used a, a color-based system in order to visualize what the animation is going to look like here. Um, consider this neuron right here. This one is only going to fire if it receives an input from this guy, from this guy, and from this guy all at the same time. That means that this one has to fire first because it's the farthest away, right? So this one's going to fire its action potential. When it gets to about here, these two will fire and they'll all converge at the same time. Meaning that this one is going to fire the earliest in time. The way that you can think of this now is that what you're going to see as red in the next images are going to be those neurons that you would see from here. They're not going to be the color red in the final piece, but red is indicating what their time is in this animation. So if I'm to walk through this for this image, from where I'm standing here, I'm going to see the red pixels, then I'm going to see the orange ones, and then the yellow ones, green, blue, violet, etc. So this is our two-dimensional rendering of what the animation is going to look like. Uh, and if you zoom into just a, a small region of it, you're seeing it's pixelated. This is about 300 dpi image normally what you're used to looking at on a, on a printed sheet of paper. How do we translate this information into the etching is the, the next step. Excuse me. The first thing that you need to know, which is the absolute heart of a micro-etching, is you need to know where the light source is. Um, <clears throat> it is a, a crucial variable. So let's just choose any spot on this two-dimensional etching here, just some xy coordinate. We know where it is in space here, and we know what its angular relationship to the light is here. But we also know its color. And based upon its color, we know where we want it to be sending the light from. So if I'm a pixel, I'm receiving light from this light up here. This is the vector that I'm receiving. This is the vector I'm going to send. 
And once we have those two angles, then we can calculate the angle that we need to make a little mirror at, at that spot, to send the photons to precisely the location that we want them to go to. <clears throat> and in reality, we're making mirrors in a little square pixel, right? Because pixels are square. So we're making a field of these tiny little cylindrical reflectors at that spot to get the light to where we want to go. Um, and this is the actual data which is used to etch the piece. This is, I find this difficult to look at. This is like an optimal stimulus for your primary visual cortex. It's something that makes you a little bit crazy. Um, but you can see, like, here's a neuron. It's defined, its outline is defined by a one angle of etching here. Um, this is zoomed way, way, way in. But this is printed at about 5,000 DPI, so more than 10 times higher resolution to, than what we're used to seeing, uh, such that we can do photolithography, which is how computer microchips are manufactured. These are the transparencies. So each one of these right here has that type of image data printed at ultra high resolution onto it. <clears throat> and the lithography happens by, let's say we're just gonna start with uh, the base material for this is a sheet of steel. So just steel right here. We laminate a photoresist, which is a polymer that's sensitive to ultraviolet light on top of it. It's commonly used in electronics manufacturing. Um, then we have an ultraviolet light, which is shined down here. This is the black printing on the transparency, and here's the clear part of the transparency. And obviously, this design is very complicated. I'm just showing you a small part here. And the light is able to penetrate through the clear part of the transparency and polymerize this region of the photoresist right here, but the black printing here protects the surface underneath from that happening. So you burn this image into the photoresist. You turn off the UV light, um, you remove the photoresist, and then you take the whole plate and you dip it into a basic solution that eats away only the soft parts that were underneath the black printing. So what was underneath the black now becomes a little wave in the surface. <clears throat> um, and this is, uh, these are some process steps. This is my assistant, Becca, uh, laminating sheets of steel in the laminator. This blue stuff here is the photoresist. You'll see that in later steps. This is uh, in my kind of homemade clean room at home, at uh, my studio. This is the ultraviolet light here. Here's the plate being exposed. This is the entrance to the clean room. Um, now, we're left with plates like this. This is what they look like after that etching step. The, the photoresist is this dark purple color. But the whole basis of this art is that it is a reflective surface which is going to be you know, spraying the light out in the ways that we want it to be doing. So we want to brighten that reflective surface up as much as possible. And the perfect aesthetic and engineering solution to this problem was gold leaf, as you can see Becca and, and AJ are, uh, are putting on here. Gold leaf is perfect because it's only 200 nanometers thick. Our etch dimensions are about 50 microns. That's like roughly a hair. Gold leaf is 100 times thinner than that. So you can conform it to the surface. And gold is soft enough that you can cram it into all these tiny little waves in that surface in order to, uh, to brighten it up and to not fill in all that uh, etched topography that you've made. Um, this is what the plates looked like. They were made larger than they needed to be initially, whereas this is the initial lineup here. <clears throat> Here's my collaborator, Brian, uh, looking at an assembly of nine of the plates. Uh, we built a custom light source for the museum uh, where light is kind of traveling down these, uh, these LEDs in order to animate the piece. And this is what it looks like under a single white light. Um, and you'll see in the exhibit here <clears throat> that uh, we've taken a lot of the shots from the, uh, from the museum in Philadelphia and have assembled them to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, but remember, this is only a tiny fraction of the whole amount of data in the piece because it's only being illuminated by one light source. It can also look like this. Uh, which has got four or five different colors of light onto it. Uh, here's a couple other ways it could be displayed. This is the thalamus and the basal ganglia here under uh, what looks like white and green light. Um, this is the folia of the cerebellum under, under multicolored light here. Again, just incredible amount of complexity in this region. We could have made the cerebellum itself a hundred times larger than it actually is and still not have had enough room to put anything, uh, everything in clearly. Um, here's a, a gyrus of the parietal cortex. 
And uh, it's cool. So anything which is the same color in these types of images is what's functionally related to one another. All the red neurons here are all firing at the same time. All the blue ones are all firing at the same time, et cetera. So there's, um, there's information in that regard as well. Uh, here's another couple of gyri. Here's the brainstem and the cerebellum. And this is what the actual piece looks like at the museum in Philadelphia. And unfortunately, it's just too big of a pain in the butt to move 3,000 miles to Lisbon to have in this exhibit. So we opted to uh, take some video of it and, and put that up. And so the question that I kept asking myself in this project, which is the hardest thing that I've ever made, uh, the most difficult project I've ever worked on, was why. And what I hope you may experience when you go to see the exhibit here, particularly if you have kids with you, is to just imagine this, that a kid walks into this museum for the first time. They stand underneath this piece, and a white light travels over it, and the piece explodes into this golden shower of light, and millions of neurons are lighting up. And that kid just has one moment of like, wow. That is worth everything. That one moment, how often do you have that kind of moment in your life? It's so rare, for me, maybe once a year, when your understanding of the world is just kind of turned on its head a little bit, when you see something that you've never seen before, when you have a technique that you haven't seen before. We could have made a digital projection, and we made this so that somebody seeing it for the first time would be even more surprised as to what they're looking at. To capture somebody's emotions, that's the power of art. That's why I do this. That's why I'm not at the lab bench anymore, because I feel like I have more of a voice in this world than I did at the bench. <clears throat> and um, to Susanna's life's work of helping us all to understand how complex the brain is in, in case of how many neurons we have, we can scream at the top of our lungs, the brain has 86 billion neurons. Like, do you understand how complicated that is? No, you don't. <laughs> because it's impossible to understand. You have no frame of reference for that. If we can show you what half a million neurons look like in a half a microsecond's worth of animation, then it's like, oh, OK, I get a little taste. Because it's coming in through your own perceptions. It's affecting your own emotions. <clears throat> And uh, that is why this piece is called Self-Reflected, because it's about your brain perceiving itself. It's meant to be what your brain is doing as you're looking at that piece of art. Your brain is doing what was in that animation now, and now, and now, and it was doing it the entire time I was giving this talk, and it's going to be doing that until the day that you're dead. And so what this piece really is about is it's a gift to everybody to remind us of how precious and incredible our brains are and in the hope that, you know, I know that our brains give us trouble too, uh, but in the hope that, you know, we treat our brains well and we treat other people's brains well. And um, that's uh, what I wanted to say. And uh, I want to thank, of course, Louis and uh, the, Gulben the Gulbenkian for inviting me. Uh, it was an honor to be here and I appreciate your attention. And I also wanted to announce that um, I am, and this is a surprise to Hui as well, that I'm going to be donating uh, a micro-etched print of this piece to the Gulbenkian Foundation um, for you to do with what you please. Um, this is a, a kind of a shrunk down version right here. It's, uh, it's almost like a holographic replicate of the, of the piece that I'm going to be uh, giving to you now in the hope that uh, folks in Portugal may enjoy it. Um, so yes, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I have a website if you're interested. And uh, yeah, muito obrigado para convite.
Okay, so <clears throat> we have now um, time for uh, discussing with, um, with both speakers of, of tonight the, the ideas that were presented here. And uh, the way I would like to develop this, this discussion was to opening up by asking each of the speakers if they have anything to ask to the other, since this uh, seminar series is, is called Brain Dialogues. I would basically challenge your brains to, to interact. I have a question. Uh, so I, I would go first with Susanna. All right. Um, Greg, the, I, I was watching you present, and, and I could only keep thinking of the, one of the common questions that I get from people, which is when they hear that uh, I study, or so many people study the brain, and we want to understand what brains are made of and how they work. I, I, I often get this question, pretty much more of a complaint. Don't you feel that explaining it is like explaining it away, is like taking the beauty away? And of course, my answer to them is no, of course not. You, 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 if anything, you appreciate much more. Um, how do you feel explaining your art, talking about what you, what you do? Huh. Well, I mean, I, I am a scientist, so I think that I have your similar approach to it, where I find beauty, much more beauty, in understanding how the nuts and bolts of it work. I mean, that famous Einstein quote that the, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. I mean, that, you know, brings me close to tears when I think about it, truly. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing that we can use our brains to understand our own brain. I mean, what a weird kind of node of evolution that has been, you know, is that the purpose of our life? Um, I, although, you know, there are times, for example, when, when people see micro etchings for the first time and they're in that moment of suspended animation of what is this? Uh -huh. Because a lot of people wouldn't have seen something like that uh, before, that that is a moment of that, I think, is is what's, engaging all of your attention because you're really trying to analyze what's happening. And so if that is drawing somebody in, I think that some amount of that is a good thing. But for me, I mean, I often tell, tell people that if I ever get in a terrible accident and can only you know, sit here and just watch a screen for the rest of my life, then put how it's made that uh, show about how factories work in front of me for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. and I'd be pretty much totally happy. So. I'm definitely of the type of person who sees beauty in how things are deconstructed. So would you, would you prefer people to see self-reflected self with or without explanation? Um, definitely for the first time without. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, in fact, I've kind of modified my talk where I talked about the technology first before showing what it was and realized that that emotional engagement, I think, is the... Uh, the most important part of it that is then followed up by the uh, explanation of the technology. That's my preferred way. Um, so I take it that you as well have a similar approach that you find the uh, kind of deconstructing of the brain to be the most beautiful component of it? Like, um, yeah, well, to, to, to be fair, when I, when I created this, this technique, uh, the, the original, so the, the way I turn brains into soup is not with a blender, it's with a, um, it's like a mortar and pestle, but in a tube, glass tube version of it. So it's a, it's a long tube, you, you toss the part of the brain that you want to process in, and then you crush it in with a tube, and as you, you just move it back and forth and up and down, and the soup forms in between the two walls of the tissue. But of course, the, 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 the first possibility that came to mind when I realized I, I want to turn brains into soup was a blender. And I would walk past this blender sitting on forgotten in a top shelf of the, the, the lab and just look at that and, and think, am I really gonna just take what once was the essence of a person and just <laughs> just blow yeah. it to pieces? <laughs> that, that, sounds, that, that sounded very harsh even to me. Uh, the, but I, 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 I think I walked past the blender often enough that I, I got used to the idea that, well, you know, when you, when you do microscopy in a, in a lab, you're 
you're really doing exactly that just in a softer piece by piece way because you're really just cutting the brain down into, into pieces and then into sections and then you look at the sections and you get down to that tiny little unit that is the, the, the neuron and I just uh, eventually realized I'm, I'm pretty much doing the same thing. It's just that I'm doing it all at once and liberating the cell nuclei, let's, let's say. And um, yeah, the goal is to get information that we couldn't get otherwise. So I, I made peace with the idea. And then I had to explain to people who would still be horrified by the idea of turning brain into soup that uh, I was not turning it into soup and then throwing it away, discarding the whole thing. I have four freezers full of brain soup in my lab <laughs> that um, we, we keep every last drop so that we can use it again and again in the, in the future. Um, so yeah, I've, I've come to grips with the idea of just destroying a a, br a brain destroying the complexity of a brain just to be able to, to look at it. Well, I mean, to be fair, if left to its own devices and nature's own devices, that brain, instead of becoming soup, would become poop it eventually. Would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It would become something else. So, yeah. yes, I, I, I'd rather in the process use it, which, by the way, is the same, uh, my, my same attitude towards the original, don't, uh, the original owners of the brains that we, that we use. Um, yeah, it, yeah, this, yeah. this way you, you get something out of them. For sure. Um, yeah, I wanted, I'd wanted to ask you about, um, you have neuron counts, obviously, which are telling you about like the overall quantity of neurons in the brain. What are your thoughts about um, how that correlates with synapses? Or if you, how to, how to say this, that you have a, neuron, a, a brain, let's say, made of fewer neurons that is more connected. Are there examples of this uh, in nature, or like, how do you see kind of the analysis of your cell counts when taken to an analysis of overall connectivity, like the numbers of synapses that I, so each we, neuron has? Um, that, that is a huge unknown. We, um, if, if we didn't really know how many neurons different brains are made of, we have even less of an idea of how many synapses different brains are, are, are made of. There's a little bit of data out there that suggests that per, let's say, gram of tissue, if you take a little cube of tissue of the same size in different cortices at least, you find fairly similar numbers of synapses in that little piece of brain. Which means that in that case, yes, two cortices of the same volume would have similar numbers of synapses and what, whoever has the bigger cortex, like the elephant, should have more synapses than the smaller cortex like our human. Um, then the next question I usually get is shouldn't that number be the number that really matters mm -hmm. to understanding complexity and information processing capabilities? I don't think it is for one reason. The, like you said, the, what, what carries information onto the next neuron is that axon and there's one axon per neuron and that's it, which means that it doesn't matter how many synapses one neuron has, doesn't matter through how many channels one neuron receives information, the output is that one output. So you have one output per neuron, doesn't matter how many synapses form that contribute to that output. So I, I, I think that in, if, there's, if the question is what is the most limiting factor or variable to how much information can be processed in the brain, I would still stick with it should be how many neurons you have, regardless of how many synapses they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys connect really well. I felt I could leave the stage and you don't need a <laughs> moderator to <laughs> oh, keep on stay. talking with each other. Uh, I have a question myself, also for, for each of you, and then I think we should really open to the audience. So. Um, Greg, I, I saw that you recently wrote a foreword for a book that I think the title, if I'm not wrong, is Why Science Needs Art. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and basically you are providing, there you, there you are providing an argument um, for the integration of two cultures that traditionally walk side by side but, but tend not to, to interact too much. And one of the things that we also tried to achieve at this exhibit was to bring more art into a scientific uh, exhibit. Um, so, can you, you know, share with us why why science needs more heart than we usually have? Well, I think that um, 
first of all, I think my definition of what science and art are a little bit different than most people's. That I see them as a spectrum, uh, science on one side, art, uh, pure science on one side, pure art on the other side. But I think that for me, what science is defined by is us trying to figure out our selves and our environment by looking outside of ourselves, whereas art is looking inside of ourselves and bringing something into objective reality for other people to be able to appreciate. And everything that we do has both of those things you know, integrated into it. When we're designing an experiment, we're reading papers, we're looking at our results, we're analyzing our data, but we're also using the synthesis of all that information within ourselves, within the context of our own experience, and are coming up with an idea which is helping us to design what the next step of experiments are. I, mean, I think science is inherently artistic and that art is inherently scientific as well. I think it's mostly that our definitions are screwed up and that many artists that I know use some degree of scientific method and many scientists I know have artistic careers like outside of their scientific ventures as well. Basically, the more you enrich your brain with activities as diverse as possible, the more you're going to get out of your brain. I think that's uh, kind of a general... Uh, Creativity. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Susanna, I don't know if you want to... No, I, I was just, I was just, I, I was just sitting here listening and, and, and thinking. Um, I, I spend most of my days reading, reading facts, read, which is what science is about. When I get home and I want to read for fun, for leisure, I read about fiction. I, I love magical fiction. I love science fiction, the kind of, it's, it's, in a way, I like to think of it as art for the brain. It's the opportunity for you to just think of things that don't exist. And that complements very nicely. Yeah, it drives right, it. Too, what you I get think. with, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Uh, artists, I mean, the, for example, the concept artists and the, uh, the writers of Star Trek, I think, drove to a large extent, how the public and scientists think about what technologies are possible in the future. I mean, sci-fi, I'm a big fan as well, and I uh, value it for that reason as well. Just to open your mind to the possibilities of what might be out there. Right. Susanna, my question for you is, is about cognition and the brain. So a number of people try to equate the, the, the brain size to the abilities mm -hmm. that the brain might uh, basically achieve. Um, what, what dimension of cognition do you think is more limited by, by brain size? Be, because you can do the kind of calculations or computations that are needed to implement a number of cognitive processes, like uh, learning by association, with small numbers of, of neurons. So why do you think so many neurons are needed to implement What do we really gain with more neurons? Is it storage of information? Is it um, I, you, well, you, you gain, you certainly gain storage, uh, you gain exponentially the uh, number of possibilities that can be considered, that can be represented in a, in a system, the more units that you have in that system. Um, you, so here's, here's one thing, you certainly don't need a huge number of neurons to be able to do things like, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to say simple things. To, to, you don't need lots, billions of neurons to do things like finding your way home or recognizing a, an individual apart from the other one. These are things that ants and bees can do with not much more than one million neurons in the, in the brain as a whole. Mm -hmm. So you can have... Even conceptual learning they can do. With they can do conceptual brains. learning. They can they can learn by imitation. They can they can learn from observing the the others. So you have all these these functions that are you you really should not even use the word simple functions. You have these really nicely complex functions that you can do with just a few neurons. I think what you don't have with just a few neurons is really what comes next, which is flexibility and complexity. Mm -hmm. It's flexibility over time, it's flexibility over different contexts, it's changing how you behave, changing what you do with the information that, that this is individual A and this is individual B, what next? Mm -hmm. um, and making all the, the, the new combinations that come on top of that. So that is what I think you gain with many more neurons, which is why 
I think it's very um, appropriate, let's say, or it's not surprising at all that we just found that animals that live longer are the animals that have more neurons in the mm -hmm. cortex. It, it, it makes sense to me Make that if you, if you live 100 years compared to just one year, it sh you, 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 at the very least, you will have use for many more neurons. If not, simply, you will need many, many, many more neurons mm -hmm. to be able to deal with all the information that you're gonna run into over 100 years of existence. So would you agree with Darwin when he, he said that the major difference in, in terms of uh, mental abilities between men and other animals is, is more of quantitative, not qualitative. quantitative oh, than of kind? Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we see. That, uh, so we can quote you that you think Darwin was right. <laughs> Oh yes, yes. I'm, 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 I'm I, I just wrote something. I, I'm happy to put that in writing too. Okay. I just, I okay. just wrote something for the the 150th anniversary of the, the descent of men, which is where okay. he said exactly that that it's it's quali quantitative, not qualitative okay. differences. So with that thought, I think we can open the, um, the discussion to the audience. Um, there are two people that raise their hands over there. If if the mics can go there. Uh, I'll just ask you to, to stand up okay. so other people can. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to say to Susanna that I related a lot with the idea of making soups out of <laughs> brains because sometimes I need to explain to my family that I need to slice frozen brains like I slice ham, for example. <laughs> so just to say that. Then I had a question for you, which is about the complexity because you said that um, quantity uh, of neurons and quantity of synapses are not the same thing because more neurons uh, don't mean more synapses and you rather say that complexity is dependent on neurons and not on synapses, right? But then uh, my question is, so during childhood you have a lot of connections, right? So the brain is full, full of connections and during childhood what happens is like you prune, right? You lose a lot of those connections and that's, that's what I thought was meaning complexity, right? Losing some connections on parole and fortifying other connections that were more important. And that's my question to you. And my question to Greg is like, how can you do or compute long range uh, inputs from, for example, the cortex to uh, the thalamus and then right back to the cortex uh, with such, I don't know, because you explained it in such a short range thing, how do you compute long range inputs and then outputs? So, thank you. Maybe Susanna um, can I go can, first. I can start. So let me, let me clarify. I don't think that complexity is measured in the number of neurons. I think that numbers of neurons are the most limiting thing to your, cog your computational capabilities. Complexity, if, if you, um, use that definition that complexity is amount, the amount of information that defines a system, that's required to define a system, then the complexity of a brain, any given brain, is the amount of information that it yes. is required to define what is every single neuron, what is it connected to, how and when do those individual synapses fire and uh, how does the whole thing come together? So complexity is, it goes way beyond how many neurons you have. How many neurons you have is just the number of Legos that you're playing with. What you build with those Legos is something else entirely, which is where um, I, I find it important to remind people that the information that defines your brain, my brain, um, or it, one brain is this and not the other, only a small part of that information is biological, starts in your genes, starts in your biology. The rest of that information, even though it is written in your biology, definitely, that information comes from the outside, um, which is why, yes, everybody here had definitely many more synapses in their brain when we were one or two years old, right? That still doesn't make us more complex as two-year-olds, two-year-old toddlers than as adults. We're definitely much more complex now and we only increase in complexity 
over our, our lifetimes. And that's exactly because even, even if we lose neurons and we don't have as many synapses as we once had, the exact confirmation, the exact pattern, the exact connectivity of our brain and what it does today has taken in much more information than it had yesterday or one second ago or 10 years ago. So yeah, we're ever growing in complexity. Good answer. <laughs> um, uh, you were talking about the long range versus short range uh, axons. One of the most key variables uh, in that piece was, actually you put your finger right on it, was um, information traveling from cortex to thalamus and back to cortex. We wanted you to be able to see that or you know, motor cortex down to spinal cord in one run through of the animation. Uh, so we set, we calibrated basically the speed of the animations to be centered around that. And then everything else kind of came off of that to, you know, so within, uh, remember that spreadsheet I was showing with all the variables? We could speed up or slow down the axons depending upon what it was. So the myelinated axons were going faster than the local axons. And so that was one way that we could control them. And if we had one particular circuit that was very important, we would key that one in to make it look exactly as we wanted to. And this algorithm that we wrote to sequence everything would kind of satisfy the constraints by moving things around in time around that. <coughs> that was another question. Hello, my name is Philippa. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate both of you because the talks were great. And I would like to ask about the role of the supporting cells, the astrocytes and the supporting cells, what role they have in making connections and making synapses, synapses uh, because there's contradiction about this and what do you, what do you think about this question? Who takes this one? Um, the, so I, I didn't say a word about the other cells in the, in the brain. That's not because they're not important. It was because I was asked to stick to 20 minutes only, and I blew that entirely, um, even without talking about glial cells. The, they, they are extremely important, of course, to the point that we know that you don't have a functional, healthy brain without glial cells. Um, we, they're so important that even though it's neurons that make the synapses and talk to each other through synapses, they only do that because astrocytes tell them to make synapses and support the function of the synapses, and then they have all the, oligo all the oligodendrocytes that feed the axon and keep the whole thing working. So there's definitely much, much, much more than what I told you. There is one interesting thing, though, um, and I think it actually, in, in a way, it talks to how incredibly important the, the glial cells, that these support cells, are compared to the neurons. We found, I, I told you about how neurons uh, can vary in size enormously from across species and even across different parts of the brain to the point that if you compare two brains of similar size, they can have completely different numbers of neurons and that's also true across different structures in the same brain. If you take a chunk of tissue in any part of any brain, it will always have a similar number of glial cells, always. You can't mess with the glia. It, it, you have to have a certain number of glial cells per unit of tissue, and that uh, is apparently one of the universals in brain diversity and, and evolution. So it's interesting because some people look at that piece of information and think that I'm saying that glial cells are boring. Uh, no. Much to the contrary, I'm, I'm really saying that they're so important that any time that evolution has messed with them, that experiment was terminated right there because you always find the same amount of glial cells per unit of brain matter, period. That's how important they have to be. We can have a last question here in the front. You talked about uh, the agricultural fire and cooking and everything, but you didn't talk about the adoption of obligatory bipedalism, and that had consequences in brain morphology. 
And I was wondering if you also think that's a contributing factor to what's called the uh, cognitive revolution that then ori gave origin to uh, human cultures? Um, bipedalism appears so when our ancestors stood up. That's, that's between three and four million years ago um, when our ancestors were still fairly small, chimpanzee-sized pretty much, um, maybe a little bit bigger than a chimpanzee. But the, that ancestor, and apparently nobody else ever became bipedal, what bipedalism changes that we, we know, we definitely know, standing up and being able to habitually walk on just your hind legs cuts in half the amount of energy that it takes to get places. When you put that in the context of primates that were already large enough that they needed to spend a very significant number of hours per day eating, if all of a sudden you stand up and, uh, if you stand up and all of a sudden because you stood up, you walking costs half as much energy, that means that you can go twice the distance that you used to, to go beforehand. So now you have access to twice the range for uh, looking for food. So that is one enormous difference when, uh, f for, f from just changing how you, how you walk. And then of course there's, um, there's still lots of ongoing arguments to this day of how important it is that when you stand up you free your hands to carry things and to manipulate things as, even as you walk. Like for instance, throwing spears and, um, well, there's the carrying part, there's the hunting part. And it's, it's interesting that people still disagree on how important that was, but certainly once you stand up, you now have two free hands, right? So those are, are two big ways in which just changes in anatomy could have consequences millions of years down the, down the road. Um, given what we've learned about the importance of food we for the brain, food. I think we are uh, getting close to eating time, so we should <laughs> stop it here. I would just um, close by asking Greg and Sonny if you want to leave a final word about what happened here today or any, anything you want to... Yeah, uh, I guess take care of your brain. Uh, <laughs> eat it in soup when possible. It's probably pretty tasty. I don't think I've ever had it. Uh, but watch out for mad cow disease. <laughs> and yeah, nice yeah. Anyway, just uh, I think it's it's good to remember every once in a while, you know, what what makes all of this possible. You know, our lives and our consciousness and our existence and. Uh, this is what it is. This is why all of us up here on stage study it. You know, it is the root of our existence. And it's just good to remember that every once in a while. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd like to do something similar. I'd like to invite all of you to play a pretend game for a little bit or maybe a little bit each day even better. Just, just ask yourselves what if we still had the 16 billion neurons that make our brain human, but we didn't go to school. We didn't care to think about, well, even just ask questions about ourselves or learn about it. Would we still be human? Or at least would we still be what we like to think that humans are about? Um, and notice I'm a biologist. I believe that it all starts with the biology. But even that is, if you, I think if you stop to think of it, it's not enough. We're much more than, we're what our biology allows us to be and to do, but we have to put in work to get there. And it's too bad that people get ac accommodated being lazy because wonderful things happen when you're not lazy. Okay. So. <laughs> so I would like to, to finish by thanking both Greg and Susanna for traveling from quite a distance to share your, your ideas here uh, with us today. Also thank Greg for your donation. I was not aware of it. Uh, yep, very thankful for, for that. And um, remind the audience that in a week we have another conference where we'll discuss the brain at the movies. Uh, Sally Baxendale from UCL London will be sharing with us uh, her views on how the brain is portrayed at the movies. 
Uh, so I hope to see you here in a week, and thank you for your, for your presence here today. Thank you.